I know I've said thank you once already to Kelly, but I hope I never run out of thank yous for people who put their hand up or say, uh, in some cases, not in Kelly's cases, oh, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really appreciative of that. As I'm saying, one of the great things, I think, or the helpful things is to see what other people are doing uh, in their classes, even if they're not immediately within our sphere or our disciplinary sphere that we can uh, see what good practices are, what's, what good work looks like. Uh, and when I sent an email out asking for some suggestions for courses that would be helpful for others to see, I got a note quickly from Liam Mitchell, uh, who, who wrote back uh, his, his, one of his top suggestions was a course by Kelly Egan. And here's what he said in his note, a thoroughly innovative remote version of a study art class, exclamation point. Well, I'm a sucker for an exclamation point. Uh, so he had me at exclamation point. That was enough for me. And that's when I reached out to Kelly uh, and Kelly uh, said that she'd be happy to do it. I'm so happy that Kelly agreed. It's my pleasure to have Kelly here with us. I've asked her to talk about her course, uh, which is CUST uh, 3111 Visual Art Studio. Uh, I've asked her to talk about the course, but zero in on one or two features uh, that engage students. I think that's one issue that's front of mind for all of us, right? As we've built these wonderful houses, but we want to be able to invite students into them, right? And have them feel like they can walk around the room and visit us and, 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 and see uh, the different, well, gosh, now I'm pushing the metaphor a little too far, the different furniture and the different artworks that are in the room. Uh, but I, I think my point is made here. Uh, I'm excited to see what's working, Kelly. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you a thousand times over. Uh, and thank you so much for all of you for coming here. Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you for uh, uh, a chunk of time. Uh, but, you know, as we, Kelly's going to give us a tour, she's going to share her screen of her course, zero in on those engage, those, those features that, that are engaging students. Uh, but then we'll certainly have some time to, to ask and answer questions. Uh, so uh, let those bubble away for you. I've got only about 92 questions, Kelly, so, so not too many that we should be able to get through. <laughs> All right, Kelly, you're on. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joel. Um, I want to start by saying thank you for thinking of me uh, and for asking me to talk about this course. Uh, I, I don't think it was quite, uh, yeah, let's do this. It was more like, uh, are you sure you want me? Um, but I was willing to share what I've been doing and what I've learned because it's been a, a, a very steep learning curve in the past three weeks. Um, so basically, uh, I'm my course is kind of a pastiche of what was working in other people's courses. I learned a lot from the workshops. Cultural studies also had a little um, staff meeting, basically, where we shared ideas and I poached some of those ideas and incorporated them into my class. So to a large extent, I'm going to read names because I feel like that's important as well. Uh, Ihor Unik also helped me a lot um, in terms of figuring out ways to engage with students. Um, last year, of course, um, the, the term ended unusually soon. Uh, and I was doing workshop courses as well. So trying to figure out ways to manage crits, which did not, or critiques, um, which did not go well in the live sort of going into Zoom world of last term was a really important factor going into this. So in order to, or focusing in on ways of creating engaged spaces for students um, that were also safe and were also productive was one of the one of the main keys in me developing my syllabus this year. Um, I took the workshop on how to do remote teaching. So I also borrowed heavily from Brent Bellamy's course structure. Uh, it was very clear. Uh, I find that being clear and concise is a very important thing uh, in this remote learning sphere. Ian McLaughlin, who is, of course, one of the founders of cultural studies and one of the great people in our department, really encouraged me and everyone else to be innovative in our course design. And I took that to heart and really did try to figure out the best ways of, of completely redesigning the course so that it would work in the visual sphere and the remote, sorry, the digital sphere. Uh, Josh Sinenko and Victoria Deswan also encouraged left me uh, encouraged everyone to do live recordings of Zoom instead of pre-recorded lectures, which I had previously been attempting to do this semester, which do not work for my teaching style. And I think added, um, 
added a lot of pressure on students to to it, it was a time demand from students that is is alleviated from the live zooms um, because I was still doing the live sessions anyway. Uh, and of course to Liam Mitchell and Chris Bayers because uh, they went on many walks with me and uh, were there when I was crying over the summer as I was trying to put this course together. So without further ado, I will bring you into my Blackboard page and into the course. So um, I was really thinking about digitality and the digital interface when I started to design this course and specifically the relationship between the digital um, and the material art world. Um, so I refocused this course to be less about practical instruction on how to create different kinds of material art forms. Um, into a much more critical analysis and self reflective tour through what it means to be making digital artworks and what it means to be exhibiting digital artworks in our current sort of um, cusp uh, world. So like Brent Bellamy, I organized the course um, into administration, um, sort of course contents, and then assignments, uh, which you can see over here. I also started a, a very, very ex uh, explicit start here page where I discussed um, my own ideas in going into this course and what I thought would, what my main direction was. Uh, I am very open to students about my thought process. And I think that's something that students really appreciate. Um, so in this, I talk about how it's not a normal year. I talk about the design structure of the Blackboard site. Um, and I talk about how I re redesigned this course to still have them actively engage. I'm reading here, sorry, you, I know you can read as well. Actively engage in research creation where you probe ideas and technologies in innovative and expanded ways, but that the projects um, and our topics would be different this year, that we would be focusing on uh, questions facing humanity on the edge of epistemological, ontological, and systemic change, issues of materiality in the digital age, shifts in affects and experience with in experience with new interfaces, questions of the primacy of visuality within digital spaces, inquiries into the relationship between intersectionality and social equity, and the post-human. Social distancing, remote learning, and digital interfaces certainly have changed the way art is being taught. Have they also changed the meaning of art and the parameters of art appreciation and the definition of the artists? Are we experiencing a shift in the work of art? And this, this is something that I repeat in the syllabus. This is something I've repeated in a lot of my um, the first classes. I think it's really important to engage with students in a way where they feel like the current moment is something that isn't um, just a reflection of what, we're, what we've lost, but a way to probe um, what we might be able to do and what we might be able to gain from this experience. Uh, you'll also notice on this page, I have made changes to my structure. And instead of erasing them from the syllabus or erasing them from Blackboard, I cross them out to let them know that this change has happened um, and to let them have a little bit of physical material history to it as well. Um, so yeah, I think that being clear is a very important part to the student engagement as, as first and foremost. But as I said in the beginning, um, I've learned a lot in the past three weeks. And the second thing that I think is really important for community uh, or for building engaged spaces is to be adaptive and to be reflective and to self-analyze what's going on and what's working. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of known for creating good, safe environments for students um, in the lives in the lived in teaching worlds. Uh, so I was really nervous about how that would translate to digital space because it is a lot easier to To be mean, just I'm going to use like plain and frank words. It's a lot easier to be ungenerous and to be uh, uh, to, to be ungenerous um, in digital platforms. So I wanted to make sure that this, that I was uh, correcting and including and working towards something that was very successful. Um, so uh, one of the successes that I've had is just by addressing the weirdness and specifically um, 
self-surveillance that happens with Zoom technology. We're constantly looking at ourselves and that's going to change the way that we behave um, and what we're willing to say or do in these digital um, classrooms. I also recognized um, very overtly from the start that this was a very difficult and traumatic time for a lot of students and for us as faculty. So I think that showing humanity and again showing this generosity is very important to students um, and helps to build a relationship or a rapport with them where they feel a little bit more at ease. Uh, I'm going to talk about some failures now before I get into some of the other successes. One of the things that I had um, I had been told by another professor actually at a different institution that one on one meetings were a really good way of of uh, establishing a relationship or rapport with your students and avoiding a lot of emails later on. Uh, while I did learn a lot from the students in these one on one meetings. Um, I was exhausted by the end of it and I don't actually remember which students said what I did take notes, but it was it becomes a blur. And not only that, I found that um, I in one course I did one on one meetings and the other one I didn't, but in the course that I did one on one meetings, the students developed a one on one rapport with me, but not with each other. So while they were very open to talking to me about anything and sending me a lot of emails, I didn't avoid emails from doing this at all. They didn't have the rapport with each other because they didn't have that same level of, of, of introduction with each other. So that was my first class that I did the one-on-one -on -one meetings and I quickly shift for 3111 into the regular groups group. What do you do? Who are you? What are you interested in? And we, we, we developed a much more um, open rapport through that, that level of introduction. I also did something this year that I think I will actually integrate into my in my in person courses when I go back to them. And that is to have used the discussion board for introductions as well. Um, where I asked students basically through the example that I set for myself at the beginning um, to introduce themselves with a photo if they felt comfortable doing that and also to use pronouns because I wanted to make sure that I was coming into this in a, a fully knowledgeable way. Um, so I started by being again very upfront and showing a picture of my cat because of course I did um, and just talked about you know where where I was in the times prior to the class. And then I found as I did that, of course, you'll notice all of my students also um, followed that sort of format of giving a little brief expression of who they were. And I got a lot of pet photos. Um, and that is a wonderful way of sharing who you are um, and what you value. So there were, there were many, many pet photos. I really appreciate this white dog that sort of photo bombed this photo as well. Um, and learning a little bit about your students because sometimes you don't get to have that level of interaction through the Zoom. Um, okay, so yes, the discussion board introductions work. The one-on-one -on -one meetings did not work for me. The recorded lectures also for me didn't work because my classrooms are so full of um, dialogue and questions and answers and probing and developing like a relationship with the students where we're learning together. I don't present work as if I am the um, almighty knowing person. I present work as we're exploring ideas together to, to, to think about where we could go. Um, so I found that the recorded lectures were difficult for me to do and were very taxing. I'm also a filmmaker, so I was very um, nitpicky about everything. Um, it would take me 20 hours to do just the sound recording and it's just not sustainable. It was not sustainable. Um, so I quickly moved from that to the live, to the live lectures. Um, yesterday, I actually did my first um, live presentations from students and I did find them a little bit more difficult than the lived experience as well because it's a little harder to manage time um, in the digital in the digital zoom interface for me in any case and also to retain attention uh, I did notice that there were more um, blank screens by the end of the class and that people had just sort of tapped out after a while successes however uh one of the things that i think 
uh, was a, a really good success for me uh, was having small assignments due early. Um, it gives you a good uh, setting of what to expect from the students. It allows you a little bit more knowledge into who needs help um, and where, where gaps might be. Um, and I'm going to get into that in a second. I wrote some notes for myself. I just want to remind again that some of the successes for my classes were again addressing the weirdness of Zoom, recognizing that this is a difficult and traumatic time for everyone, and being human. Uh, I'm not going to lie here. I have cried in three of my six classes so far on Zoom. Uh, the students, I think, appreciate that humanity, uh, especially since, well, yeah, I. I the issues that I'm, I'm feeling emotional about are also issues that they're feeling emotional about. And to know that they can feel safe and they can show emotion um, is important, I think. So other uh, wonderful things that I've done, wonderful things that I've done, sorry, that's a little bit. Some of the things that I've found to be very successful. Uh, this is coming from Ehor specifically. He introduced me to VoiceThread and VoiceThread has been wonderful. So again, I was worried about how students would engage with each other's work, um, art production in the digital sphere. Uh, so I had them, I, I'm having them post all of their work onto VoiceThread, which kind of, um, I'm teaching photography also, so it kind of operates visually as if it were uh, a different form of Instagram. So it's an interface that the students are used to. They're used to seeing pictures and clicking on them and being able to post comments. So this, these were posted yesterday. So there's not a lot of comments on them, but for instance, um, in this voice thread, you can see that there have been two comments from students as well. So they'll watch the material and they can make comments. Um, they can either print write them or they can, I, I don't know what that one is, but they can record or they can do a little video. Uh, most of the students choose to just do text-based replies. Um, and then they can, they can actually, in, they can, they can, exchange ideas with their fellow students and you'll find obviously when one student comments on one person's artwork then that leads for that leads to the the student whose artwork has been commented on to go and look at the other person's artwork so it creates community in that way um, and it definitely shows commonalities of interest that allow students to further explore ideas together um, so i found that VoiceThread was has been very very helpful uh, it doesn't, the platform itself doesn't appreciate um, videos as much as it appreciates still images or PDFs. So students, I, I did get some emails about students struggling to upload their, their videos and just explain to them, you know, it's a, it's a technical difficulty. That's fine. So I guess another important point of this is to be understanding. Um, and yeah, obviously there's going to be glitches in the system and to accept that and to let them know that this happens in the world. Nothing is smooth in the world. Sometimes glitches happen and you have to just work through them. Uh, I've also found from Jessica Barr, I borrowed the idea of having a, a course, uh, a code of conduct for the course. And oops, wrong voice thread. Uh, I've never, there's always been an implicit code of contact in my courses, but there has never been an overt one. So I did write up uh, an overt listed code of conduct for the students, um, which is, it's basically obvious um, things to be respectful, um, to be aware that there are triggers and to offer trigger warnings, to be aware of the power of language in your words, like just basic, basic things to think about, especially when students are producing artwork um, that they're emotionally attached to and that uh, they might, maybe they, this isn't a fine art school, maybe they've never done this before. So to allow them, uh, again, like this idea that this is a safe, comfortable place where we are exploring ideas and pushing each other so that not everything is going to be sugar coated, but it's okay for it not to be sugar coated and it's okay to feel vulnerable in these situations. 
Um, I've also found, and this Josh actually was someone who really turned me on to this idea, but that the breakout rooms have been really helpful. Uh, I've always been someone who doesn't want to put students on the spot, and I felt like breakout rooms added a little bit of pressure, but the smaller groups really allow for students to communicate um, a lot more effectively and openly. So uh, what I've been doing is having the breakout groups and I think it's really important to have them come back to the main group and to discuss what happens to have someone who's going to report back. Um, without that reporting back, uh, they just become comfortable with their small little groups and they don't feel more comfortable with the larger group. Um, again, I'm having different issues in different classes. I think it's important to, to, to not have one script that you just imply onto everything. One of my classes is very good at group conversation and they're very comfortable with each other in that setting. Another one of my classes doesn't talk. <laughs> they're fine online, they're fine in discussion board and on um, voice thread, but when you're actually in the Zoom environment, they're very timid. They're fine in the breakout rooms, but in that, that main group, they're very shy. The other one, they could just chat the entire time. And I think a lot of that has to do with those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, that's, my, that's my theory in any case. I also think that, you know, responding to emails quickly is important to let them know that you're here for them. Uh, and again, as I said, showing humanity, it's okay to make mistakes uh, and it's okay to correct them. That's a huge learning experience for people to have them watch you make mistakes and correct them to know that it's not the ultimate failure in life uh, to, to take a misstep. Yeah, and lastly, I think that the most important thing, so we've got I don't remember what my talking points were. Be clear, be adaptive. Lastly, to be open and generous. Uh, to try new things, to make changes to the structure when necessary, which I have definitely done in the past three weeks. Uh, uh, and to also, like, it's really important, like we're struggling with two to four classes. The students have five plus work, plus they're getting blamed for the spread of COVID, plus their own personal dynamics. They're, they're in a very, very difficult moment of their lives. So we have to, because we have to give them room um, and we have to be open to what they need. So again, be generous, even when they're asking terrible questions, because they're going to ask you terrible questions. Um, and to reach out to students that are quiet or seem like they're struggling. Um, I've been in Zoom meetings that have been for like three hour Zoom meetings and not had not felt like I've had the opportunity to talk because there are powerful voices. So if someone in, in your, your class, I'm lucky because I have 20 students, so granted I have small classes. If someone in your class doesn't seem to be participating, just send them a small email. This, these little gestures mean a lot to students um, and they don't take that much time. So that's my spiel. Be generous, be open, be adaptive, and be clear. When you make changes, make sure that you note them somewhere so that they don't feel like they're um, lost in the ether. I have been using the announcement page pretty regularly to, instead of just sending emails, which I typically do, to, to put them on Blackboard and to use Blackboard as really the backbone of my courses and allow for students to find all of the information through Blackboard. Yeah. Sorry, Joel, I went on a little bit longer than you wanted. <laughs> How dare you? I'm sorry. <laughs> Kelly, that was just so incredible. Uh, and what a, what a helpful run through about what's working well and also uh, what you're learning along the way. I think that's the, the sense of sure, allowing students to learn, but also the sense that, that you're bringing to it, that you're learning along the way and sharing that with students. That's gonna give them permission uh, to do well in your course, right? And to ask questions and reach out when they need help, right? So uh, I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that people here in this room are thinking about questions, or I'm sure they are. Uh, I've, I've as I've said, I said I had 92, but I, I think now I only have 192. Uh, but uh, I have some very specific questions. If people have questions, we're a small enough group. Um, you can raise your hand, certainly, in that, that very formal way that Zoom allows, but, but also feel free to unmute yourself. 
uh, or if you, if you want to put put your question into the chat, I think those would be ways that, that we can have uh, bring our questions forward to Kelly. Um, does anybody have questions, or what? I should say in a proper teacherly way, what questions do people have? Oh, James, sorry. Yes, you're waving at me. You're high fiving your camera almost. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, your hand is raised. I just need you to unmute yourself. Well played. <laughs> Playing by the rules. I, I just, I really want to say one uh, about being adaptable. I, I was a high school teacher last year and ended my career online and a lot of the students couldn't participate. And so I had to record lessons. It was dreadful. The same as you, I did the voice thing for about 30 times and then finally just said, okay, there's five mistakes, not 20. But the other thing is adapting to already with my students. So if there's I think four of us doing the second year practicum course and I'm have veered way off because something came up in the first very first discussion board that I thought was just an easy peasy let's get people to talk about an you know experience you found in one of your placements and one of the experiences was dreadful and uh, so I made it the next discussion board thing and, and turned it into a positive thing. So I, like, I think it's important as you, particularly with like discussion boards or the, 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 the um, what's it called? Voice thread thing to like respond to, you know, that the, what they need to hear next, because it, you're not necessarily in a regular kind of relaxed classroom where just discussions with small groups happen and stuff. So T tends to get dropped into a discussion thing like a bomb this was mm -hmm. and so I, but I think you have to kind of go but I've got next week planned or whatever you have to give that up a bit I think so I think that was good advice thank you and, and I agree James too like that in some ways that's harder in these courses that we spent so much time planning early right it's mm -hmm. harder to make that that adaptation Kelly did you want to speak to that at all uh, no, I totally agree with you. I think that's something that we would do in the live classroom. And that's something that we definitely, it's easier to like just close the door on it when we're digital, because again, like these interfaces are so weird, but I think that we do, again, we have that responsibility to our students to see where their needs are. Mm -hmm. um, I also, you reminded me that in discussion board, because students can put information as well as we can put information. Um, I have used it as there's something called online musings that I've done so students can share things that are interesting to them or things that they find even when they're researching. I forgot to talk about my first assignment, which is unfortunate, which was basically in a museum assignment where we talk about websites um, as openings to um, the art world now in a very different way. And so as they were exploring these different museums, they also found um, artworks that they were interested in. So they started posting these artworks and this online music thing, which was really helpful. And I'm gonna obviously go, I look and see what they've posted mm -hmm. and try and incorporate them into my classroom or try and incorporate um, what is interesting to them back into their hmm. lessons. Hmm. I like, uh, that's another signal that you're hearing and engaging with them, uh, Kelly. Uh, I think that's really helpful. Uh, one of the questions that I had for you, because this is a question that keeps coming to, towards the CTL, and, and I'm curious how, how you're thinking about it. You've given us some clues uh, on this issue already. Um, but a lot of people are, are wondering how to make their uh, live Zoom lectures more engaging. And what they're dealing with in some cases are uh, cameras that are turned off, which I know this is something that at the CTL we've been talking about in, in terms of allowing that to happen for sure. But also how do we engage students in these live lecture classes? Uh, you talked about breakout rooms. I, I understand that. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's great. I want to say low pressure, low risk activity, uh, less room to, than to, to fail or feel vulnerable than in front of the whole group. Uh, but what are other ways that you think about structuring those live lectures that might be different or might be similar to what you're doing in a face-to-face -face classroom? Asking questions, um, mm -hmm. like actually directing attention back to the students, because even if you're sharing your screen, you only see four of them, so you don't know what's happening at all. So making sure to ask questions and having those uncomfortable pauses right? Like letting it rest, letting that blankless rest until one of them speaks because they're going to speak, but you don't need to fill that air. Wait for them to speak. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, um, that's the only thing I can really like just again, like engage with them, ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that's, I'll, I'll share that that's one of the hardest things for me to do. I want to more so in zoom than I do in person, want to fill the air, fill the space. Uh, I, I talk more in stream rather than with pauses, uh, which I'm not always used to doing. What other questions might people have in this particular room? I'll take Kelly's good advice and pause with silence. Suzanne. Oh, well, first of all, Kelly, thank you so much for doing this and for being willing to share your, your teaching um, the, and the course. Looks like a fantastic course. I would love to take it. <laughs> Um, my question may be uh, a bit too technical. I've had um, students do uh, mini presentations through VoiceThread, but I only use the commercial version that gives them like a, a, a few free um, uh, sessions that they can do. I have never been able to figure out the Trent VoiceThread that is embedded in Blackboard. Did you take a tutorial to learn that or would you suggest going to IT? Because I, I do like VoiceThread. I kind of press buttons until they work. That's what I do. So here, I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen. Uh, so um, let's say that I was in Let's just add another VoiceThread link to this because there's already 12. So when you do build content, build comment, build content, you can see there's VoiceThread integrated. Okay. Just click on VoiceThread integrated, then you put the name, you put everything, and then it will I'll take you directly to Trent's VoiceThread. Fantastic. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Yeah, from there, it's pretty self-explanatory then. Exactly. Um, there is, once you get to their voice thread, there is a section where you have course view or personal view. Always do course view because I have found the reason, sorry, I'm going back to this. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that there's been so much confusion about how to upload things in voice thread in this class is because this play, this page, this link, I did to course view. So it allows students to see the course view. In this link, I did personal view, which unfortunately brings them to my grading page. Oh, no. So, yeah, uh, you have this, you have the percentages, and so I, some, I have to erase this, obviously. I have to redo everything, but I was learning. Um, and I didn't want to erase it when they had things done. Do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Course view. I, I'll, I'll share this as well. Uh, whenever we bring up, uh, so every Wednesday we have uh, a meeting between the CTL, Trent Online, and IT. And we always bring up maybe once a month, twice a month, the issue of voice thread. Uh, so I feel if I don't speak just a little bit on this, uh, people in that meeting will turn to me and say, Joel, you had an opportunity. So what I should say here is that there is some difficulty that IT feels and Trent Online feels in supporting the use of VoiceThread, right? That they, it doesn't, they don't have access to the back end of VoiceThread in the same way they have access to the back end of Blackboard to make changes and help people. They will always try to help people as best they can. Kelly, if you run into issues, they have the, the, the uh, best attempt or best try uh, version or model of support that they will work through. Sometimes there are some difficulties in doing so. So that's just a flag, Suzanne. Uh, if you're thinking about incorporating it in a course, do so with that in mind that there might be some technical issues that is less a reflection of IT's ability or willingness to support and more so the kind of access they have in the application it has. So there might be some challenges and they're concerned, there's some concern about if everybody starts using VoiceThread, how can we support everybody? But, uh, and, but, and yet it still becomes a, a wonderful tool in a course like Kelly's. It might work well in courses like yours, Suzanne, as well. I, I don't want that to, to, to scare anyone off using VoiceThread, but sort of walk into using VoiceThread with eyes wide open as well, right? That there might be some of those technical challenges. 
Uh, but reach out to IT, Trent Online. Also, Josh and Trent Online knows a lot about VoiceThread. He's, he's the, vo- the VoiceThread person to turn to in some cases. Uh, so uh, that would be another person to go to, Suzanne, if you're wanting to set it up for your course to reach out the, to them directly as well. Great. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what other questions do people have? Anne, how are you? Hey there, doing good. good. Um, so this is a, a, a bit of a nerdy art question, but hopefully applicable to other pedagogical traditions. I'm, I'm really curious how you go about providing like informative critique and instruction on questions of technique. Um, right? Like stuff that would be just easier to demonstrate in person or, or um, uh, you know, like sort of walk students through a couple of rough drafts, um, working on muscle memory kind of issues before one sits down and writes like a paragraph describing formally what's happening or could happen in a, in a given case. Um, that's obviously going to be like a bit of a speed bump that we hit on the, the digital path. I'm wondering if it's happened to you and, and how you've crossed that, that river. I cried. Um, basically, yeah, because also we're not a fine arts student, student, we're not a fine arts school. We can't assume that students have the same access, material, anything. Um, so I'm gonna speak about photography, which is a little bit easier than something like drawing. I ran into this last year with drawing where I was trying to grade or it wasn't even live critiques. So I was just trying to grade their final projects and I had no scope of what these projects were. I had no idea what was going on. You can't see the mark. You can't see anything. You're seeing representations of their images and that just, ugh, it, it didn't work at all. So part of my restructuring of this class was to try and avoid the same problems that I had in terms of, of um, evaluation rather than critique, but evaluation. Um, I've also found it difficult to teach practical uh, um, applications at all. Um, I, it, photography, I cried because I was teaching them how to do something in Photoshop and I realized two of the students had Photoshop. So uh, it, it, it's a problem. I have no solution to it, it's a problem. I think we're on the same page there. <laughs> it, it, it's a problem. I also get the sense, Kelly, that you're also finding it's not just what works, but also what's possible, right? Like you're recognizing that that problem and then moving into the space of what's possible. Uh, and I very much appreciate that. Uh, I had another uh, question in, in terms of uh, encouraging students to, to offer good critiques. You talked about the sense of uh, generosity, right? With the students and you want the students to be able to share that with uh, other students when they write their critiques or their evaluations on VoiceThread, for instance. And I saw that certainly that code of conduct, code of conduct. What other instruction are you giving students in order to offer that commentary? Yeah, because again, a lot of the students coming into this have never had uh, formal art training at all. So they don't know how to engage with works of others. So um, I asked them to start by asking questions um, and usually to, to frame those questions with their own experience and their own reflection of an artwork. Um, so to think about what, like to think about their experience of, of what a student is presenting and then to contextualize it through the theories that we've been talking about in class. Uh, and that allows for a further probing or exploration of the artwork in a way that isn't pointed um, or critical of the student that is, that is um, presenting, it's more dialogical. So it, it really does benefit the students and it also fits with cultural studies, right? So where it's not just production that we're doing, we're doing, or not just creation, we're doing research creation. So there's elements of it that, that are going to link into theory. And this is just another way of exploring or probing ideas. It's just that the end result isn't an essay, which is also a creative work, but the end result isn't an essay. The end result is a video or a photograph or a painting. Um, so that helps like reframing it through the university sphere. And I assume you're, you're talking about that in your Zoom classes, right? How to do a good one. Are, are you giving them written instructions as well? Are you modeling that as well? No. Okay. So it's coming through the Zoom classroom. 
Yeah, and um, again, I also model crits after um, the way that it happened, my crits happened in my MFA, which mm -hmm. is the faculty say nothing for the first half okay. of the crit, um, and you just allow the students to, to flesh out their ideas. And then I come in, because I don't want them to be influenced yeah. by what my perspective is. I want them to do the work. Not the work of grading, but the yeah. work of like, coming <laughs> to the artwork. I very much appreciate that. Uh, maybe Suzanne and I will sign up for one of your courses at some point. <laughs> uh, I, I, we are at 1042. I know everybody's uh, super busy. I'm, I'm grateful for you, for you all staying in the room. Uh, any other questions? I'll, I'll, I'll sort of solicit one more time uh, for questions. Look around the room. Stephanie, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, I don't have a question. I just had a comment, which was um, to say thanks, Kelly, for this. And also um, your emphasis on generosity, I think, uh, for me is really important 